All this stuff from Earth and Light each. We don't need this. No, no. We don't need them. And plus, you know, you're hot talking. You talk about bacteria irrigation. Irrigation. Oh, yeah. Into a seed. Into a seed. That's all we got in there. And can we grow it on our own? Yes. Oh. Sure you can. In the teeming with your trees? With one giant. Okay. Test, test. All right, we're going to start the afternoon sessions, and I'm saying this mainly for the main hall. Main hall on, Josh? Can you turn the main hall on? Just to let them know we're starting. Okay, great. All right, I want to introduce a different side of um, Jeff here. Um, he's kind of a crazy, kooky guy which I really appreciate the way he teaches because a lot of this material is hard to take in. And when he makes you laugh, it opens a part of your brain up so you go, oh, I can get this, okay? So he lives in Anchorage, Alaska. And he was telling me that in 1970, 1975, the Supreme Court of Alaska voted that the state has no right to find out what you're doing in your home. What do you think of that? Okay, and then you know that Jeff is a lawyer. He's an attorney. And he wrote, what was it called? He wrote the opinion on what it means to have privacy in your home. With regard to cannabis. With regard to cannabis. Now, this is big to me because you guys know that last year I broke my knee, right? And they gave me oxycodone, and I was sick as a dog because I'm really allergic to it. And after two days, I was so sick. And then my friend who I love, brought me some CBD, and I put it on my knee, and I went cold turkey off the oxycodone and never looked back. We don't need these opiates because they're killing us. And it's really not the government's business. I'm sorry I'm going to jag on this. It's none of their business what we're doing in our homes. Don't you believe that? I mean, really. It's not their business. So um, this is a man of many talents. He's got a lot going on, all right? But to me, this is the most interesting thing. When I first read his book, Teeming with Microbes, it was the first book I outlined since high school. <laughs> Seriously, and I've been teaching it ever since. How about another warm welcome for Jeff Lowenfels? You bet. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, I think you can. So let's go through this. Uh, you know, this, I was going to come down here and show this slide and say thank you so much for you know, inviting me to warm California. <laughs> you know, I was going to show you my driveway. You know, I was going to show you the sun setting over the Pacific. Uh, but I got it right here, you know. But anyway, so <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, so again, same picture of Roger Swain and I. Uh, Roger, Roger likes this book, I might add. Uh, he's a funny guy. I write on a computer. Roger comes up to me and he holds his little teeny pencil and he goes, this is my printer, this is my computer. You know, crazy. Uh, so I've got these three books, or two books, I guess, and then I wrote the third book. Um, and I call myself Lord of the Roots. You know, I got all this stupid stuff in there. So let's get down to business. This is an Alaskan sled dog doing his business. Uh, when I first started gardening, uh, nobody owned their own phone. The telephone company owned the phones. They were black. They were attached to the wall. When you left the place you were staying at, moved to someplace else, you left the phone there. Crazy. Oops. Uh, there were magazines everywhere. Oh my god, we had magazines absolutely everywhere. We even had gardening magazines, which is hard to believe. Um, we had aluminum foil came out of nowhere when I was growing up. Plastic, oh my God, we had plastic. We, we ate with plastic, we ate plastic. Remember this picture? Uh, and uh, you know, we played with plastic. Oh my God, plastic was everywhere. Uh, we had these brand new fertilizers that were developed. They were new, they were better, they were gonna make things so cool. We learned how to spray our foods. You know, this was instant coffee developed. Unbelievable. And we had a television show called Better Living Through Chemistry, Mr. Wizard. 
That's Mr. Wizard. He had this little assistant, this little dweeb, uh, you know, who, who was his foil. Uh, unfortunately, it was, and it was better living through chemistry. Uh, and she got a little older, like most of us in our generation, she took the chemistry a little bit too far. But anyway, uh, this is today. No aluminum foil, Jiffy Pop. You know, who, who would know what a, a Jiffy Pop thing was? Uh, no aluminum foil, TV dinners. This is our instant coffee. We all own an own telephone, at least one. We carry them around in our pockets, for goodness sakes. Uh, you know, we all have magazines in the telephone. There's even a television in the telephone. And when we want information, we can get it anytime and any place. Simple as that. Uh, I took this picture years ago, uh, a couple of years ago. Well, you know, you go to the airport now. This is the sign, sign at the airport. But it's 2019. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people are still using the same old fertilizers, uh, you know, just different packaging. We're still spraying food, because who wants a blemish on it? We're stuck. We're stuck. Uh, and one of the reasons why we're stuck is because of these guys, and people like these guys, uh, who, you know, make fertilizers. Now, I was the biggest miracle Grow fertilizer in, user in the world. Uh, and I used to go to the Garden Writer of America meetings, and I would argue with them about organics versus non-organics. And I would say, you know, it doesn't matter to a plant whether the nitrogen comes from a brown manure or a green powder. It's nitrogen. Why does the plant care? Nitrogen is nitrogen. Prove to me that I'm wrong. Well, okay, so I used to have these arguments all the time, year in and year out, and then one day a friend of mine who's here, Tom, are you here? He's here, he'll wander in, sent me this picture. And I was in the, in the middle of the winter in Anchorage, Alaska. My wife was at a university on the East Coast. I was all alone. I got this picture in 1994 or five, and I looked at it and I didn't know what the hell I was looking at. Well, it turns out this is a nematode. Nematodes are blind. They travel in the soil at a temperature gradient where they're gonna hit the food that they eat. And this guy's traveling around looking for a tomato plant, and all of a sudden, he swims in to these wonderful smelling lifesavers, those two little lifesavers, and he swims into them. And once he gets in them, oh, oh, by the way, Tom sent me this picture with the words the soil food web on it. I didn't know what it was, and you lose. I didn't know why. But once that little guy swims in there, his body touches these two little spots on those rings, and they fill up with water, and they strangle them. That's a single fungal hyphae protecting a tomato plant. This blew me away. At the time, I had been writing a garden column for about 30 years. Longest running garden columns in North America. I had no idea something like this was going on in the soil. Nematode getting strangled by a single fungal hyphae, which is protecting a plant root. Blew my mind. I couldn't figure it out. You know, wow. Soil food web, that's what it must be. So I studied like crazy, I looked and looked and looked, and I finally found something on the soil food web. Uh, by the way, I carry that picture around with me. Um, I found this, and it had Dr. Elaine Ingham's name on it, 1988, and I looked at it and I didn't know what the hell I was looking at. I couldn't pronounce the word mycorrhizal, nonetheless know what it was. What was I looking at? I had no idea. And so I had to figure it out, and I went and looked more and more and more and more. Uh, it took me about 48 hours of no sleep, and I ended up finding this picture. And I could give the whole talk based on this picture. Uh, again, I showed it before. 50 to 60 percent of the photosynthetic energy goes into the plant. There's some kind of a hum here. It goes. Is it on this thing? Hmm. Whatever, I'll get away from it. Um, anyway, uh, so you get the photosynthetic energy, and, and uh, God, what happened here? Oh, there we go. So you get the photosynthetic energy, and it uh, is used not to produce the flowers, not to produce the tomato, but to produce these things called exudates that drip out into the soil from the roots. Now, you're sitting here exudating right now. The exudates here are designed specifically with carbon in them to attract bacteria and fungus that need that carbon. And as you sit here exudating, you're sweating, 
you're also producing an exudate that attracts bacteria and fungi. So your skin is covered with bacteria and fungi because you are also exudating. Now these bacteria and fungi attract nematodes and protozoa, just like the bacteria and fungi on your bodies, by the way. If you disappeared, your entire shape would still be here because of the nematodes that are covering you. So don't, don't get too freaked out, but that's what's going on. And the nematodes and the protozoa eat the fungus and the bacteria because they also need carbon, and so they eat the carbon that's in the bacteria and the fungus. And they poop out the excess, and the excess poop contains all sorts of nutrients, particularly nitrogen in plant usable form. It's got a charge on it. Then, of course, you get the bigger guys, you eat the littler guys, all the way on up to us. This is the soil food web. I could give the whole lecture off of this. I won't because it's boring as hell. Uh, so I'm going to give you a quick little short course. And I always tell people who watch this thing, don't take notes. Do not take notes for two reasons. First of all, I'm going to repeat this a million different times. You're going to know exactly what happens. And second of all, for God's sakes, there's a book. And the book's been translated into 11 different languages. So buy the book. Don't take notes. Uh, it's that simple. Uh, you can get it in Dutch. You can get it in two French versions. You can get it in Romanian, Lithuanian. Anyway. Uh, so here's a short course. I don't have a lot of the equipment that Elaine Ingham has, so you're going to have to view this through my weird way of looking at things. Uh, and uh, I want you to pretend that these three trees are sitting there on a Friday afternoon in front of your wonderful courthouse that you've got here, which is the weirdest looking building I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> and these three plants are hungry. And so one of them says, let's get some Japanese tonight. And one of them says, no, Mexican. And one of them says, no, French. And because the Japanese tree is bigger, uh, it gets the Japanese food. And so what does what is they do? This, these are the roots, OK? So let's pretend these are the roots of the tree. Let's put them upside down, OK? <laughs> so they want Japanese food, so they produce an exudate, which drips out into the root system. And the next thing you know, attracts Japanese bacteria. <laughs> now, if the plant wanted American food, it would just simply change the exudate. If it wanted French food, it would change the exudate. You know, and it would end up with what it needs. And it works on all kinds of plants, not just regular farm plants. So again, you know, they, they eat the same exact way. It's the same thing. So the bottom line is you're not needed. The plant gets its own food. It puts these exudates out and it attracts what it needs. And if it needs something different, it can change the exudate to attract that different thing. Whew, pretty cool. Uh, you're not needed. Now, what the plant's trying to do, in addition to feed itself, is attract as many of these microbes as it can and as much diversity in the microbial mix that it attracts as it possibly can. And interestingly, we discovered about a year and a half ago that there are basically 511 bacterial types that are in every single soil sample that supports plant growth in the world. Wow, 511. So at some point in time, not only are we going to understand a little bit more about this diversity, but we're going to be able to tell whether those basic 511 bacteria are in our soils. And if they're not, how do we put them in so that we've got the same thing that you need to have in order to have plants grow? Pretty cool. Uh, and the reason why you want diversity uh, is not only do, do, do you get things diverse, but diversity is what protects us. You know, if we were all alligators and there's only one little chicken in there, oh shit, you know, simple as that. Um, now, I showed this before. These are these uh, exudates that are coming out of a plant root. These are ex-DNA cells. These are white blood cell type things. They're out there in the soil. Uh, and and in, in a teaspoon of soil, there are 500, to a, uh, 500 million to a trillion bacteria. And when I wrote the book, that's what I said. Then I had to revise the book because we discovered that in the soil, there are also these things called archaea. Now, I had never heard of archaea. Archaea turned out to be the third branch of life. And the reason I never heard of it was because it was discovered in 1978. They look like bacteria. They just have a different cell wall. Well, I went to school in 1967. So I didn't learn that. You may not have learned it either. So now it's 500 million to a trillion archaea. We used to think they only lived in uh, hot uh, vents, uh, geysers, places like that. But now we've discovered that the dominant organism in the oceans, dominant organism, and in the two-step nitrogen fixing process, 
that happens in the soil, they're the dominant organism for the second step. So they're very, very important. We're beginning to study them and learn a lot more about them. They are one of the branches of life, unbelievable. Um, so you've got 500 million to a trillion bacteria and archaea in a teaspoon of good soil. These guys are capable of, of breaking down simple carbon molecules, the edges of, of long, complex carbon molecules, but they're, they're not really capable of breaking them in half, breaking them apart. They just nibble on the edges of them. Uh, easy to digest things. And so, uh, you know, like cellulose. And they eat and eat and they breed and they breed. I can't show you the breeding pictures, mixed audience, but I can show you the eating pictures. And if we took two, uh, two uh, bacterium and put them in a petri dish in ideal conditions, in six weeks the earth would be covered, you know, 18 feet high with bacterium. Fortunately, we do not have ideal conditions. Uh, but they breed like crazy. Uh, we water our plants to keep the microbes alive as much as to keep the plants alive, because they need water. Um, and uh, there's some beautiful, beautiful bacteria uh, called actinomycetes. These are the ones we get a lot of our drugs from. Uh, they're absolutely spectacular. And when you smell compost, it has that beautiful smell to it. That's called geosim, and it comes from one of these guys. And they are really stunning. Uh, you all know we've got the uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria, rhizobia, but there's also one, uh, a, a microbe that's related to the bacteria, actinomycetes, uh, on a plant. Uh, they make something known as a, a, a nitrogen fixing frankia. And so uh, these are a different kind of nitrogen fixation. And the key thing about these bacteria is they produce a slime. They produce a slime so that they can form colonies that can protect themselves. And the slime layer not only helps them form the colony, but it, 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 it makes it difficult for things to get in to eat them, because it's gicky. Now, this slime is identical to the slime in your mouth when you get up in the morning and you brush your teeth. And you notice you can't just wash your mouth out to get rid of this stuff. You have to use energy to get these guys off your teeth. And you're all licking your teeth right now. It always happens. Um, now, this slime has some very important properties. The first is that it's sticky. And so little particles of soil stick to each other because of the bacterial slime that's in the soil. And so you begin to get soil structure as a result of this bacterial slime. The other thing is this bacterial slime has a pH above 7. So if your soil is dominated by bacteria, it has a pH above 7, because there are nitrogen-fixing bacteria in there, so you have a pH above 7. So it's sticky and a pH above 7. And there are good bacteria, and obviously we all know there are bad bacteria. And the bad bacteria are kept in check by the diversity and the 511 good bacterias until things get out of whack. And then they come out. They're opportunistic. Now, in that same teaspoon of soil, there are 14 feet of invisible fungal hyphae. Um, let's just get it over with, you know, fungus. Uh, all these jokes they got about fungus. Let's talk about fungus in general. Uh, I gave a talk, incidentally, I gave a talk at the Midwest Organic Group. Uh, and I, gave, I had this slide there. At the end of the talk, somebody came up and yelled at me. You insulted the American military. I'm not trying to insult. I'm just talking about... Fungi in general was trying to make a little joke. They never invited me back because of that slide. But anyway, um, you know, there are all these jokes about mushrooms, uh, but they're so important. Uh, really kind of cool stuff. Gotta, gotta include some of these, you know. They're my favorite. Sorry, I have to just sort of do this, but. All right. <clears throat> So uh, these are the characteristics of a fungus, and they're different. they're different from plants basically because they don't contain chlorophyll, and the cell wall is made out of chitin, the same stuff that's on lobsters uh, and crabs. Okay? Now there's two kinds of fungus. There are yeast fungus, and the only reason why I care about those is because these are what you use to make beer uh, and bread. And the second kind of fungus are the filamentous fungus, both of which are very important, actually, in soil. It turns out those yeast fungi are really, when I talk about that rhizophagy that I talked about at the first talk, and I'll talk about it again today, yeast fungi act like the bacteria in a rhizophagy situation, which I'll talk about. But 
Really, most of the fungus that we care, are concerned about are what we call molds or hyphal fungi. Uh, they have a septa separating them. Some of them only have one nucleus. Some of them have several nucleus. The nucleus sometimes can float around from one, one septa to another. Uh, the largest organism in the world is a fungus. This is in Oregon, uh, and it's killing all the trees above it. It's about three and a half miles in diameter, uh, and it's just one single fungal organism. Fungus have the same body parts as plants, except they don't have the cell wall, and they don't have uh, a chloroplast. We never study them, but they're, they're just like plant cells. I don't know why we don't study them, uh, and we really probably should. This is what they look like. They got those microtubules, blah, 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 all, this, all the little parts. And then that little green thing up at the front. That green thing sort of acts like the brain for the fungus. Um, uh, and I'll talk about that in a couple of, couple of seconds. There's a chitin wall around the fungus, very, very important. Um, and that chitin wall looks like this. And then you notice that double membrane down at the bottom. So you got the wall and then you got a membrane. Um, and that chitin, it's got a surface coat on it that's a glycoprotein. And this surface coat, uh, there's that double membrane, there's the glycoprotein. This surface coat, uh, waterproofs the plant, and they have these same uh, 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 membranes that have these, these uh, uh, proteins in them that act as tunnels and channels to, to let food in and out. They operate just like a plant uh, operates, except again, they don't make their own carbon. They have to go out and get the carbon. Uh, and this is, this is uh, something known as hydrophobins. Uh, this is the, that surface. That surface is capable of producing a waterproofing material individual molecules that can coat the entire fungi. You ever notice when you take a mushroom, and you drop it in water and you pull it out, it's not wet. It doesn't soak up water because it's got this wonderful waterproof layer on the outside of it, uh, which keeps the, keeps the integrity of the plant and prevents the water from getting in and dissolving the mushroom. In fact, I will tell you this. How many people eat mushrooms in their salads? Everybody does. You've never digested one of them. They go right through you. Think of all the mushrooms you've eaten that haven't been cooked. If you don't cook a mushroom, you cannot digest it. Hmm, interesting. Just as an aside, uh, uh, the mushroom coating may actually be vitamin C and vitamin D. So when you take a mushroom from a store, you should always put the mushroom out in the sun it will increase the vitamin D in that mushroom by 2,000%, even though the mushroom's been cut, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, it's a waterproofer. Um, the way these guys eat is they eat by digesting in the soil. They put an acid out into the soil, and then that digests the food, and then they bring the food into the body of the fungus. Uh, and uh, that little green spots, those green spots I showed you before, are, are, are depicted here in that little bright spot. So down at the bottom is the beginning of a fungal growth, and then you move up, the fungus is, is becoming more and more active and growing. That spot's called a spritzen cropper. A lot of, a lot of stuff involving fungus has German words because the Germans really were the ones that studied a lot of this stuff. Um, so the spritzen cropper is sort of like a, a command center. Uh, and it, it calls up all the stuff from the back of the fungi, you know, because what has to happen is the fungus has to open up the tip and add more wall bricks so that it can move forward. But it has to open it up without spilling everything out. Very complex, very complicated, and so it uses all the molecules in the back and the enzymes, just like a plant, calls everything up the spritz and cropper, uh, and, and, and it's a real command center. And so it looks around, notice it has the book over there, to, you know, just in case it gets confused. And uh, this is a, uh, a fungus growing, 30 seconds. It can move quite a, quite a distance, actually. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it, that spritz and cropper is always bright when it's active, and when the thing is not active, the spritz and cropper basically disappears. Uh, kind of cool. And there it is up at the front. And there's all that structural stuff that supports the, supports the little guy. Now, those stuck together bacterial pieces of soil are woven together by fungal hyphae. 
So they weave together those, and so you now you get more soil structure. And what they're weaving together are not bricks. They're not flat. They're, they've got irregular shapes. And so when you stick them together, you end up getting pore spaces. Soil structure comes from bacteria and fungus. Who knew? Nobody. Uh, and so you get this wonderful situation where you get pore spaces. The little guys can hide from the bigger guys. Air is in there. It turns into CO2. You get water, pushes the CO2 out, pulls in fresh air on, behind it. This is soil structure comes from fungi and bacteria. And of course, you can uh, grow mycelium in soil. If you take a, hand, a handful of a good soil compost, put it into a yogurt cup, uh, put a lid on it loosely, put it in the dark in a warm location like a furnace room, in 48 hours, you occasionally got to go wipe off some excess water off the lid. You get something like this. I used to carry around, literally, this particular sample in a little plastic Tupperware thing. And I would start my lectures. I would hand it out. The thing would go all the way around, come back in exactly the same shape. You could drop it. It would bounce. It's like a sponge because of all of those fungal hyphae. The individual fungal hyphae are invisible. And thousands of them come together to form an individual white thread. And then thousands more of those multiply and duplicate. And you end up with this unbelievable structure of stuff. Now, the TSA used to open it up and sniff it. you know. And since they were working without money and everything else, I decided, yeah, we don't want to get them sick. So I don't, I don't carry it around with me anymore. But you should try it. Find out how much fungal you have in your soil. You'll be absolutely amazed handful of baby oatmeal to feed the fungus in a handful of soil in a yogurt cup, 48 hours later, boom, something like that. Um, and th this is what they look like. Uh, and occasionally, they'll merge together and form what's known as a rhizomorph, which is a water pipeline. So they'll carry water around the entire system. Uh, and that's what they look like when they merge together, forming those rhizomorphs. Beautiful things. And it used to be very complicated to identify them. You had to look at the spore. You had to look at the mushrooms. You had to oh, look Very, very complicated. Almost impossible. Constantly changing the names and the classifications. Now we can use DNA. And so it's much simpler. And everything's being reorganized. And I'm going to talk about them later on as well. The key thing is fungi cannot produce their own carbon. They have to travel in the soil find the bacteria or the protozoa that they're going to eat, eat it. When it happens next to the root system, they poop out the excess, and they feed the plant. they got to go get carbon, and that's why that system works that way. Uh, now, their properties create a situation where the pH is below 7. So if your soil is dominated by fungus, it has a pH below 7, okay? And uh, it's acetic. They break down really hard to digest things. So they can, they can break down the centers of these long, complex molecules. And they really can break down almost anything, including the truck, for that matter. Uh, and uh, here's, a, here's a single fungal hyphae going into some rock to pull out the nutrients out of the rock. So that acid's very, very strong. Uh, and there are some beautiful, beautiful fungus above ground that are known as endophytes. These were first discovered when people had cattle, and the cattle wouldn't eat particular kinds of grasses. The grasses had a fungus in it that the cattle didn't like the way it tasted. It wasn't there for the cattle. It was there to prevent insects from grazing on it. So they figured out what it was, and now people are studying endophytes. Every single plant has at least one endophyte. Most of them have two or 300 endophytes. Every plant on, the, on Earth and, and we're trying to figure out what they really do. Because once we figure out what they do, we might be able to harvest them and use them for, for good things. So endophytes are something we're going to be learning a lot about. And we're now, of course, at the point where we've learned an awful lot about another kind of fungus known as mycorrhizal fungi. And we learned so much about it that I was able to write a book on it, which you should definitely get and enjoy. Uh, mycorrhizal fungi form a symbiotic relationship with 96% of plants on Earth. They form a partnership. Now, again, i got to tell you, as embarrassed as I am, America's longest-running garden columnist had no idea what they were. In 1996, after I discovered what they were, 
I went to a garden writers meeting with Dr. Elaine Ingham in, in uh, uh, Seattle. There were 760 garden writers there. I got up and I said, how many people here know what a mycorrhizal fungi was? You think the person who writes the column for the New York Times raised her hand? No. Anchorage Daily News? No. Nobody, not one garden writer in America knew what a mycorrhizal fungus was. Holy crow. So if you didn't hear of them for a while, that's because the people who were writing and telling you and trying to teach you stuff had no idea what it was. So they're very, very important. They are everywhere. Uh, and and you've got to have them if you're going to have plants to grow well. Ugh. So turns out that there are five or so, let's see what do we got there? Seven kinds of mycorrhizal fungi. The only ones that we're really concerned about are the ectomycorrhizal and the endomycorrhizal, although I should tell you that orchids will not grow, they won't even germinate, unless the right mycorrhizal fungi infects them. So these are the two that we care about as gardeners and as growers, the ectomycorrhizal fungi and the endomycorrhizal fungi. All right, now, where did these guys come from? They came as a result of Bismarck, not, not this Bismarck, but this Bismarck. The Germans were always a little pissed off that if they wanted to have a truffle, they had to get a French truffle. And the Germans don't like the French. French don't like the Germans either, but uh, so uh, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm said, God damn it, we're going to find our own truffles. And so he had his chancellor go out and hire the finest biologist that they could find, botanist, because they didn't realize that fungus truffles were fungi and they didn't know fungi were, were, were not plants anyway. We thought they were plants. And so they hired the guy and, 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 and his job was to find German truffles, okay? Now, you know, if you've never had truffle French fries, you can't understand why the Kaiser was so insistent on it, but it's great stuff. They love truffles. And so they hired this guy uh, named Albert Frank. And Albert Frank was the leading uh, 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 botanical guy in Europe. And Albert uh, used every method he possibly could to try to discover German truffles. And so they studied every, the, how the French did it. And you know they used everything they possibly could in order to be able to try to find them. And they failed. They could not find any truffles in Germany, which was really, really disappointing. But what they did find were roots that seemed to be covered with fungus. Everywhere they, they looked, because it was, wasn't him doing the work, it was his grad students, uh, they kept finding these things that, that, that were roots, but they were covered with fungus. So you know, a root covered with fungus. They drew pictures because they, they couldn't, they couldn't uh, take photographs back then. Uh, and so they got these wonderful things. And they, they couldn't figure out what they were. All the roots they saw, all the roots they saw were covered with fungus. Who knew what the hell they were? So Dr. Frank writes a, a book. And uh, there it is. Which translates into on the nutritional dependence of certain trees on root symbiosis with below ground fungi. And he predicted that these fungi were feeding the trees in return for exudates. And he just theorized about it. He had no proof, couldn't prove it. And it took 50 years before finally they proved that he was absolutely right. Wow, unbelievable. Um, and what they were finding were roots with these sheaths around them and a net around them. They called it the Hartek net, named after a guy who in the 1850s had discovered some fungus. And they go in between the cells, but they don't invade the cell. Hmm, interesting. Now back then, you know, fungus were bad. We had a fungicide industry developing. And so, you know, people can say, no, these can't be helpful. There's no such thing as a fungus that helps. They only destroy. And these guys are going inside the plants and they're killing them. That's, that, that was what the prevailing theory was. Now we knew about lichens. You know, we knew that lichens were, was, were a combination with a fungal, a fungal partner. Turns out, incidentally, I don't know if you know this, last year a high school student, a high school student, discovered that every lichen 
has not one kind of fungus in it, but two kinds. Wow. I mean, how many scientists, you know, had studied this? <laughs> and some high school kid last year discovers, no, there's two funguses in these, two different kinds. Anyway, you know, so it shouldn't have been surprising that there were mycorrhizal fungus that were associating with other stuff, but it was. Uh, and, and, and then, you know, people discovered what these guys were doing. They're, they're, they're small, they're going out and mining areas that the root can't get, and they're bringing back all sorts of unbelievably important nutrients that the plant needs to have. Wow, really an unbelievable thing. So what's really going on here is uh, this. So well, by the way, I have to tell you, it's mycorrhizal when you're talking about an adjective, mycorrhizal fungi, okay? Mycorrhiza is the single relationship between one fungus and one root. Mycorrhizae is the plural. All sorts of labels say, this bag contains mycorrhiza. No, it doesn't. It contains mycorrhizal fungus, which will associate with a plant root and form a mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza is the relationship. So we just got to get this right. I am an annoyance at soil conferences because I always raise my hand and go, don't you mean mycorrhizal fungi, not mycorrhiza? And they go, yeah, you're right. But they still continue to do it. And here's how they work. So you got two seedlings. These guys are sitting in the sun one day. And one of them says, you know, God darn it, I'm hungry. And I would like some bologna. I want a bologna sandwich. So what does it do? Well, it mixes up the right exudate. And in this particular instance, the exudates always contain something uh, called a stridolactone. OK? And that's the attractant that's used. It's actually named after a plant that produces it on its own. Uh, but it's, 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 it's the attractant that the plant uses to attract the fungus. And so uh, the plant puts the stuff out in the soil. Okay? And the next thing you know, it catches the fungus. The fungus comes to the root. And it, it, it enters the root. Okay? So there it is going into the root. What a wonderful picture that is. And that fungus goes into the root. The other end goes out into the soil to get the baloney. And it does. It finds the baloney. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, there's all sorts of baloney there. And it, it, it finds the baloney. <laughs> That's the Republican side. <laughs> and just to be good, we'll put a couple on the Democratic side. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, it finds the baloney. Sorry about this. Uh, I don't know why. It, ah! And it brings the bologna back to the plant. And the plant eats the bologna sandwich and it grows. And the cool thing is that once it's infected by the mycorrhizal fungi, it stays there and it continues to feed the plant. And what's really cool is if you've got two plants next to each other, even if they're not the same kinds of plants, they can share the goodies through their myco mycorrhizal networks. Whoa, crazy, absolutely crazy, you know? Uh, who knew, who knew that mycorrhizal fungi did that? Okay, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about them in a couple of minutes, but so you also got several thousand protozoa in that little teaspoon of soil. Now you all studied protozoa in high school and nobody ever remembers what this is, right? What is this? It's a paramecium. You all studied paramecium in 10th grade. You all took home a diagram that looked like the bottom of your shoe, and you had to label what was on it. This is what they look like today. One paramecium will eat 10,000 bacterium and poop out the, the resultant nitrogen every single day. So if you've got a lot of these guys, you've got a lot of nitrogen being produced and cycled into the plant. This is the other one. This is the amoeba. We all said we saw this one in high school. Nobody ever did. This is what they look like today, and this is one that attacks dogs. <clears throat> anyway, uh, there are 40 to 50 nematodes along with those protozoa in the soil. And again, you're coated with nematodes. I don't want to freak you out, but the, the difference between the nematodes uh, are the mouth parts. And so some of these mouth parts are benign, and some of them are really frightening. So for example, this one. <laughs> now remember, you're coated with, with, with these guys. This one actually, though, just happens to be rubber spatulas waving water that contains bacteria into the body of the nematode. 
And this one, on the other hand, is a little bit more menacing. Uh, when it gets to what it wants to eat, it sticks that little needle into the cytoplasm of the organism and eats it. Simple as that. Um, this one is hookworm, and this one attacks dogs. Uh, <clears throat> this is what it looks like when it hits your cannabis plant. This is a, you know, a bad nematode root problem. One of the things about mycorrhizal fungi is that they're coated, again, with chitin, right? They have a chitin wall. Nematodes don't like chitin. So if your plants are properly infected with mycorrhizal fungi, then nematodes have a hard time infecting it. You can buy beneficial nematodes now. More and more are being developed. This particular uh, fella, you put, it, you put it out on the soil, it heat sinks into the back of slugs and it lays its eggs in the slugs. The slugs contain, uh, the eggs sacs contain bacteria, kill off the, uh, the, the guy, and oh God, what a mess. Uh, so uh, this is a root, and in soil, you have a very low level of carbon. A good farm, a really good organic farm, might have four or 5% carbon in the soil. But right around the root zone, you get a tremendous concentration of carbon, because these exudates that drip out of the plant all contain carbon. And so you get a tremendous attraction of those bacteria and fungi. So what you've got going on in the soil, basically, is you've got the nematodes and the protozoa eating the bacteria and the fungi that are attracted to the plant by the, exudate, by the exudates. And the poop that is resulting from all this eating is what feeds the plants. Now, this poop is always in nitrogen form ammonia. It is always NH4. When you walk through a forest, a lot of times you can actually smell the ammonia. You go to a, a compost pile at one stage or another, you can smell the ammonia. All of the resultant pooping contain, uh, nitrogen is ammonia form. But if you put that ammonia form nitrogen into soil that is fungally dominated, it stays that way. But if you put it into soil that is bacterially dominated, nitrogen fixing bacteria take a lot of that ammonia and convert it to nitrates. So if your soils are, are full of bacteria, you get nitrates produced for your plants, and your plants like that nitrate, that's what they need, but if it's full of fungal, which is what your plants are attracting and it likes, then you get ammonia. So there's two kinds of nitrogen for plants. Who knew? And some plants, they can live off of either kind, but they prefer one over the other. And so your job as a farmer is to figure out what kind of nitrogen your crop wants. Now, it used to be we used this system. So you start out at the beach and you go to the old growth forest. At the beach level, because there's no detritus for fungi to eat, there's only bacteria. And as you go out towards the uh, uh, old growth forest, you end up with more and more fungal material. And by the time you get to the old growth forest, you've got 50,000 fungi to each bacteria. So you get the opposite end at that end. So all you have to do is figure out where your plant belongs on this continuum which is not that easy. Where's the strawberry plant belong? I don't know. Uh, so what we did is we developed this system. And uh, this is really simple. If your plants are in the ground for less than a year, so bulbs, because you get a new bulb every year underneath the old bulb, annuals, row crops, less than a year, they like the bacterially dominated soil because they want the nitrates. If the, so if the plant stays in the soil for more than a year, perennials, shrubs, trees, they like fungally dominated soil, and they like the ammonia. And it turns out that if you have lawns, they like a little bit of both. This is why people tell you if you're taking care of a yard, you leave the grass clippings, okay? Because they turn into fungal food, and they cover with bacteria, and, so it's, it's the system. Now, I talked a little bit uh, earlier about rhizophagy. 
And it turns out we used to think that, that just the mycorrhizal fungi entered the roots, but now we're, we're discovering rhizophagy. What an incredible thing. And it just blows my mind. And I'm thinking, am I going to have to do an addition to the book? I think I am. We don't know quite enough yet because it hasn't really all been reported yet. But this is, this is one of the papers. Uh, and it shows all this stuff happening. These bacteria going into the plant, dropping their cell walls, being oxidized, or the nutrients being oxidized off the plant, then going out and forming or causing to be formed a hair that enables the thing to be deposited away from the root in new soil that's not been mined before. Mind-boggling. Complex, mind-boggling. How do they figure these things out? I do not know. But you're going to be hearing an awful lot, I believe, about the rhizophagy cycle. We're going to find out which bacteria, so far, every bacterium that feeds a plant can go through this system based upon what they've studied so far. But we'll find out. Wow, things are going to change. So again, these root hairs may actually be for ejecting the bacteria, not for taking in nutrients. Whew. This changes the whole way you look at the stuff. It's just a different, a different system. Uh, and again, we've got these two different uh, pathways. And you have to remember that in the cell walls, you have a space where things can be stored. Bacteria that have antibiotics, that eat other stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all, all very, very important. Um, this is that rhizophagy again. So what happens is they go into the root. They form these little four deals. They lose their pot. I mean, they've got pictures of it all. There they are emerging from one of the roots, uh, popping out, going into the soil, putting on their, their cell wall again. And, doing things. All right, so then you got bigger things in the soil, um, and we have to take a look at those. And the way you look at those, and it's really kind of fun, is you make something known as a Berlese funnel. Guy was Italian, so I used to think it was Berlese. It's Berlese. And what you do is you take a pop bottle, you cut it in half, you throw away the cap, you put a little screen here. My, my wife, who I remember was uh, on the East Coast studying when I was getting into this stuff, uh, still wonders why there's a little patch on the screen door to the kitchen back door. Uh, it's because she wasn't around, and I needed to make one of these right away because I was that intrigued. Uh, and I made one, and what you do is you put soil in there, and then you put a lamp on top of it. And what happens is the light and the heat causes the organisms that are in the soil to go down through the screen into the little cup at the bottom, where you collect them and then you take a look at them and you figure out what you've got there. Uh, and it's like, it's like nothing I've ever seen. What a coliseum of gladiators eating, you know, being eaten by lions and vice versa. Whoa, unbelievable. Uh, so you see all sorts of mites and little guys in there, microorthropods. Uh, you might see a japajid. This is a japajid. Ooh, don't want to get bit by those guys. Uh, different kinds of mites, springtails with, with a fulcrum. This, this fulcrum underneath the guy here can jump 10 feet when, it, when a prey hits it. If you've got those springtails in your soil, then you've got fungally dominated soil. And so one of the reasons why you want to see these bigger guys is because you can use them to determine whether your soil is fungally dominated or bacterially dominated. And what you do is you just identify what you see in that little cup. Wait a minute. We can identify birds. We can identify snakes. There are books on identifying insects. Where is the book on identifying soil organisms? Uh, it's, it does exist. I'm going to show it to you in a couple of minutes. Uh, you know, if you had that book, you'd be able to tell that one of these eats fungus and one of those eats bacteria. And then you would know what you had. This is basically what you see at the bottom of that, that little cup. Uh, all manner of mites like crazy. My son, who went to MIT, and I literally went to fisticuffs <laughs> to be the one that got to take a look at the, what was going in when the first time we did this thing. Uh, it's absolutely incredible. So there's the arbiter and the gamacid, the two different kinds. Um, there's the springtail with the fulcrum. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of springtails. Who knew? 
Um, and, you know, it's really an eat, eaten world down there. The, the book's name is Life in the Soil. Life in the Soil. If you only take one note, that's a note to take. Life in the Soil by a guy named James Nardi. And he's an uh, assistant professor at the University of Illinois. And he drew pictures of all the organisms you can come across in the soil. And then a little paragraph about what they eat, which enables you to determine whether your soil is fungally dominated or bacterially dominated. And again, it's an eat, be eaten world down there. And this increases soil structure because you've got all those stuck together particles woven together. And now you've got organisms, larvae and adults, that are traveling through it, making more pore spaces so that when it rains, it pushes the bad air in, pulls in the good air, blah, blah, blah. You get all sorts of things. And of course, you know, they're eating stuff, killing stuff. The stuff that's killed stays there. It gets broken down by bacteria and fungi. You know, so you're, getting, you're adding organics into the soil. Uh, you know, you've got mites eating white flies. Uh, you got the evil rove beetle running around. Uh, come on, folks, rove beetle. <laughs> OK, gotcha. Uh, and then you got, you know, we know ants. Oh my god, ants, they bring stuff down into the soil. Uh, that, 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 that decays and organic. You got all these wonderful things, you know, adult big eyes. Um, the nymphs, they eat 47 mites a day. 47 mites a day, not 48 or 46. The figure was 47 mites a day. Um, and then you got these guys, pill bugs and sow bugs. These are crustaceans. They come from the ocean. And so what they do is you know, they have to remain moist all the time. They circulate their urine throughout their systems constantly. And they love boron to the point where, because there's not much of it in the soil, they eat their own dung in order to preserve the boron. So if you've got these guys in your soil, you've got pretty good boron in your soil. Um, it's interesting. Uh, by the way, I, I was at a cannabis grow a couple of weeks ago that were inundated with these guys. There's a special kind of masking tape that you put down on the soil, and they go right to it. Whew. Never seen so many in my life. Unbelievable. Uh, and then, of course, you've got guys like this. You know, spiders they are not necessarily in the soil, you know, but they keep predators in check. Uh, you know, or they are the predator. And so they keep some of the, some of the bad guys' numbers low, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and then you want to see the even bigger guys. You just take a handful of soil, and you, you throw it into the into a bucket of water. See what floats to the top. All manner of stuff floats to the top. And again, use your nardi. You figure out what it's eating, what's eating it, blah, 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 all the way down. You can figure out whether your soil's fungally dominated or bacterially dominated. Then you got worms. Now, you know, worms are, are true alchemists. I don't have to tell you folks about worms. But in Anchorage, Alaska, where I write a garden column, people started calling me up about 15 years ago. What are these lumps in my lawn? How do I get rid of these lumps in my lawn? <laughs> well, these lumps turned out to be worm castings. Worms are not native to the United States. They were, they were at one time, the glaciers basically knocked them out. The pilgrims brought them in, the ballast of their ships. Johnny Appleseed wanders around, you know, worm spreading. Oregon Trail, they bring plants. Or, and next, you know, mom's lilac that they brought from Connecticut, and it had worms. So worms began to spread throughout the United States, and they hit Anchorage, Alaska about 15 years ago. <laughs> And I would have to explain to people, I can't believe I'm explaining to people, these are worm castings. You want worm castings. Worms are phenomenal. Worms are blind. They hate the sunlight, which is why you don't normally see them in the daytime come out in the rain. Um, <clears throat> so what they do is they come out at night, and they pull organic matter down into the soil. They're unbelievable. So, so you got a worm, blind, no hands, right? And it finds a leaf. Now, a leaf's like an umbrella. If you try to pull it into a hole the wrong way, it's not going to go. The ribs are going to prevent it from going in. So the, the worm knows, blind, no hands, how to flip the leaf so that it'll fold when it comes down. Unbelievable. And they eat that leaf. They don't give a damn about the leaf. They just want a little of the protozoa and a little of the bacteria and maybe some of the fungi that might happen to be on the leaf. These are those worm castings that people freaked out about. Uh, and what I try to tell people, you know, is that these worm castings contain high nutrient contents. You want them. You don't want to get rid of them. You want them. 
uh, because they've got 10 times, you can read as well as I can. They increase and concentrate what goes into the worm, and so what comes out the back end is much richer. This is why vermicompost is so popular, because it's great stuff. All right, everything's part of the soil food web. You know, that frog is part of the soil food web. Uh, you know, slime mold, you ever seen slime mold? I, I wrote about slime mold in my book, the first one, and I had never seen it before. I went to give my very first talk on slime mold, I mean on uh, uh, soil food web in Virginia. And I was at the University of Virginia in the parking lot of the hotel. It was raining so hard I couldn't get out of the car. And when it finally stopped raining, I got out of the car. There was vomit all over the parking lot. Ugh, I said to myself, this, they must have just had a big football game and some hell of a tailgate party in this parking lot. Well, it turned out to be slime mold. <laughs> These are individual amoeba-like organisms that come together, gazillions of them, and form this vomity looking stuff, and it moves and eats and decays stuff. It's, it's really cool. So everything's part of the soil food web, even this bear. This bear at my window in Anchorage, Alaska. Now, if you look carefully, a couple of things about this. There's just a screen here, the window is open. And if you look over here, you see where my head was about a nanosecond before my wife took this picture. And I was sitting there, and I'm hearing this breathing. And I'm saying to myself, self, you're not looking at any porno. What's going on? So I get up, oh my god, there's a bear there. Bears are not that smart. It's just a screen. Could have been right in there watching television with me. Uh, so you never know what you're going to see. We know what bears do in the woods. It's part of the soil food web. You, know? you never know what you can see in the window in Anchorage, Alaska. You can see a moose. Moose poop has, has got tremendous amounts of cellulose in it. Not that good for, for stuff, but makes a nice drink swizzle stick to sell to the tourists. Um, one time, I was looking out the window, just once, and I saw a pair of palins. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Again, I live in Alaska. I'm allowed to pick on her. Um, then there are the beetles. Not, not these guys. These guys. Dung beetles. Boy, are dung beetles cool. These are the coolest organisms. Uh, they're really, really something. Uh, and they're very, very important. Incredibly important. I don't know if you've got dung beetles here. I have a friend. Yeah, of course you do. Because yeah, you've got cattle here. I have a friend in Oregon who has a dung beetle ranch in Bend, Oregon. A dung beetle ranch. And he ships dung beetles around the world, different kinds of dung beetles. Yeah, go ahead, go click it. It's dung beetles, he puts them in little match boxes and ships them out. Now that's my kind of ranching, you know what I mean? Yeah, let's go out there and spend 30 seconds and get the herd together. We're done for the day. Unbelievable. So uh, dung beetles, this is a true sign. This happens to be in Australia, where they do have the right of way uh, for important reasons. Uh, now. They've discovered how dung beetles can travel. And what, they do, what a dung beetle will do is it'll hop into a, a, a pile of dung, make a ball, and then roll the ball right into its burrow, straight line. How does it do that? Well, <laughs> they put these little shades on top of them, and they discovered that they actually used the Milky Way in order to navigate. Psh, boy, oh boy. Can you imagine? Hey, what are you doing at school, kid? Hey, Dad, I'm doing this study on, on dung beetle navigation. Hmm, okay, I'm spending $60,000 for that. Yeah, interesting. Anyway, they're really cool organisms. So here's a dung beetle. See these red things? These red things are mites. Now, when a dung beetle hops into a pile of dung, the mites hop off and take out the competition, fly larvae. And then when the dung beetle gets the ball all set, ready to go, blows the whistle, the mites get back on the dung beetle, and off it goes, ready to repeat the process. Very cool. So in Australia, when they brought the cattle in and all the convicts, they forgot the dung beetles. And there were kangaroo dung beetles and koala bear dung beetles, but they did not work on cattle poop. So this is what Australia looked like. There were no dung beetles there. They had to go to Africa and bring back the right kind of dung beetles, which they did. They cleaned up this place. And here's what Australia looks like today, thanks to dung beetles. So uh, very, very important member of the soil food web. 
Even birds are part of the soil food web. Now, they don't go underground, obviously, but every now and then they'll fly around with a worm in its mouth, see another, another uh, 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 robin worth talking to, and drop the worm. So they're like taxi cabs. They're coated with protozoa. So when they touch the ground, their feet deposit protozoa. Those worms, incidentally, are coated with fungal spores and bacteria, and so they're also taxi cabs. It's a great part of the food web system. And then, of course, us, man, women. We're part of the soil food web, and we are not a good part of the soil food web, in particular because we use these products made by companies that are glyphosate-loving pieces of shit, pardon me, um, and anybody who buys, I'm sorry, miracle Grow needs to realize that miracle Grow licenses Roundup. They don't have to. They're not making a lot of money on it, but they license Roundup, and they shouldn't. And if the old man was alive today, I'm sure they wouldn't, they wouldn't still have it, and the best thing they could ever do, because it turns out miracle Grow is the largest purveyor of organics in the United States, and probably the world. Unbelievable, isn't it? But they sell Roundup, so don't use it until they stop. Simple as that. Don't use it anyway for reasons I'm going to explain. And I'm the only guy in the world who can badmouth miracle Grow like this. And I do all the time. Why? Well, here's the thing about miracle Grow. Remember that picture? The margarine? So one day, I was at a garden writers conference. And Horace Hagedorn, the founder of miracle Grow, was the keynote speaker. And we're all there listening to him. This was before anybody realized that Roundup was bad. And we're listening to him and eating it up. Great speaker. And he talks about how he got in the business. He was a graduate from the University of Pennsylvania in advertising. And so what does he do? He goes to work in New York City, like all the other people, except for the fun ones who went up to Boston to work for Gillette. He ends up working for a butter company. And the second minute that he's there, he learns all butter sold in the United States basically is USDA grade A butter. It's all the same. The only difference is the package. Ah, oh, shit, he said. How am I going to change the world? What, am I, what the heck am I going to do learning? How? Ah, it's all the same stuff. Anyway, so he worked there for a while. He hated the job. But while he was there, he convinced them to make margarine and to put out a margarine package. And uh, he explained to us as he was going through the process of how he got into miracle Grow that he hated this job so much that, that he would spend his weekends either trying to figure out how to kill himself without having somebody have him to clean up because he was a considerate guy, or to clear his head. And so one time, he drove to New Jersey and went to a greenhouse that was owned by a guy named Otto Stern. Otto had a secret formula. The flowers were phenomenal. Horace says, how did you do it? He says, I have a secret formula. Horace says, geez, I'm an advertising guy. Why don't we go into business together? So they put an ad in the uh, New York Herald, 1954 on a Sunday, before and after Miracle Grow plant. We've all seen the ads. Lo and behold, by Thursday, he'd made $20,000 in cash. So he goes to the butter company. He goes, you know what, guys? I just made three times as much as I make in a year here. <laughs> I'm going into the fertilizer business. I love you guys. I hate this business. I quit. And sure enough, he did. And then he explained to us how he built the business up in his garage. And then one day, he gets a phone call from Scott's Lawn Company. And they said, we're going to buy you out. He goes, oh, really? Let's have a meeting. So they have a meeting. And at the meeting, he says to them, you're not buying me out. I'm reverse buying you out. And 350 million bucks, he buys Scott's. And so now it's Scott's Miracle Grow. Well, he tells the story, and afterwards, we had all been given a little box of miracle Grow. We all went up to get autographs. And I'm there in the back, because I'm taller than most of the other garden writers. And I'm a polite guy, so I let everybody go in front of me. Hagedorn is about this big, looks up. He goes, oh my god, are you a Lowenfels? I go, yep. Turns out, my father and grandfather owned the butter company. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out that my father had three sons. And so we were all lined up to see who would be on the package of Happy Boy Margarine. And I lost. And I'm on the package even today. <laughs> we don't even own the company anymore. I'm still on the package. Uh, 
and I got a lot of grief as a kid growing up for that. I can tell you that. And so come and get me, Miracle Grow. Because I don't think there's a jury in the world who would convict as a result of what I had to go through being the Miracle Grow margarine boy. But anyway, uh, the thing about Miracle Grow, God, this stuff is phenomenal. It really works. And the reason why it works is because it's such heavily concentrated nitrogen based that just a teeny little bit of it needs to touch the root. The rest of it goes down to China. It doesn't go down to China. The rest of it goes down to the Mississippi Delta. You know that, that picture? Farmers use one quarter the nitrogen of gardeners. So gardeners have a lot to do with that. Farmers have a lot less to do with it than we thought. But it's phenomenal stuff. But here's the problem. I won't just pick on miracle Grow. I'll pick on all these salt-based things. When you take salt and you put it next to a single cell organism, a funny thing happens. The water inside the single cell organism wants to dilute the salt. The salt wants to dilute the water. And so you get this reverse direction, osmosis diffusion kind of thing. And you end up with kind of an equilibrium. But you also end up with a dead single cell because you've busted it up. And so instead of having this, you have this because there's no fungal hyphae protecting the root. You've killed it off. Now, it is true that some of these salts attract microbes and change greatly the diversity, which is also not very good. So you end up with the wrong kind of diversity. So either they kill the stuff off, or they change the diversity, and you end up with problems. So the plant says to itself, gee, I'm getting free nitrogen. Why am I wasting my energy producing exudates to attract nitrogen-fixing bacteria? So it stops. Hmm, mycorrhizal fungi, I don't need them. You're feeding me. I'll take my food from you, not the mycorrhizal fungi. And so it breaks that partnership. And all of a sudden, you end up with all sorts of problems because you're feeding the plant. You're becoming the base of the soil food web. And if you look at the label of miracle Grow, it says you've got to use it every two to three weeks. Why? Because you've destroyed the base of the soil food web. And if you don't use it, your plants don't do well until the base of the soil food web gets back again. And that takes time. So you get all sorts of problems, um, not the least of which I'm about to talk about. No glomalin and none of those things that those mycorrhizal fungi are picking up. And I will talk about glomalin in a quick minute. So you end up with dependency and disease. And then, you know, you go, uh oh, got to do something about this. And, you get problems. And then we do other stupid things, you know? I, I'm sorry I'm showing this picture because I really went through my thing. I took out all of the sexist Me Too type pictures. And, but I left this one in there because this woman, I am sure, died the following year. I mean, my God. She's out there spraying 2,4-D on lawns, you know, and, and craziness. Uh, you know, and then we do things like we rototill, right? And rototill, you know, we, we rototill. Uh, we do it this way, uh, you know, and we do it this way. When, when, you, when you, in Anchorage, Alaska, when I wrote my garden columns on rototilling, you know, everybody rents their rototiller in Anchorage. You get it for four hours. You say, I'm going to go get the rototiller. You go get the rototiller. You get it. You take it out of the car. You go this way. Then you go this way. Then you go this way. And then you go this way again. And then this way again for about two and a half, three hours. You finish rototilling, you say to the spouse, I'm taking the, the thing back. Don't get in the garden. Don't let the dog out in the garden. Don't let the kids in the garden. You come back from, roto from, from the rototilling place. You can put your arm into the, th like this. Wow, ready to plant. So you plant, and then it rains. And the first thing that happens is, wait a minute, you get this air starts getting pushed out. You live in a place like Anchorage, Alaska, or Grass Valley, and it snows, you end up with a weight of the snow and ice pushing even more air out. And so eventually what happens is, as a result of rototilling, you get some bad, bad things. Now, why do we rototill? Because of Jethro Tull, OK? <laughs> not, not this guy. It's <clears throat> somewhere around here. But this guy, Jethro Tull, the real Jethro Tull, who happened to have been an attorney, like I am, uh, in the English uh, 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 days, he, he was one of the guys that believed in what was known as the humus theory. 
Plants eat the soil, and that's how they get their nutrients. And so if that's true, why don't we just pulverize the soil up so that it's easier for the plants to eat. Now, this guy wrote a lot, and Thomas Jefferson, well, let's see if I got a picture of these guys, the founding gardeners. So it turns out to be Jefferson, Madison, Adams, uh, and Washington. They were all farmers, and they talked to each other about farming all the time. And one of them says, geez, I just read this incredible paper. And it says, you know, we can break the soil up so our plants will do better. And so let's try that. And, and they did. Everybody in America broke the soil up. Why? It worked incredibly well. You took this old growth forest, fungally dominated, and you broke it up rototilling because of these writings, and you ended up with a bacterially dominated soil. What do row crops and cotton, the things that they were growing like? They like that soil to be bacterially dominated. So it made so much sense and it worked. And people said, gee, this is phenomenal. We've, we've turned our soils into barely being able to grow row crops, into being able to grow them easily by just breaking up the soil. And so every year thereafter, people rototill. We still do it today for that very same reason. But it turns out that when you rototill and you cut a worm in half, you don't get two worms <laughs> unless you hit it at the 18th segment. One segment will live. Uh, when you rototill, the fungal hyphae network that's throughout the soil is broken up. Those plants aren't feeding each other. They're not talking to each other. And they're not getting the nutrients until they reestablish that mycorrhizae with the mycorrhizal fungi. Whoa. Now, it turns out these mycorrhizal fungi, that water coat, that glycoprotein, is putting something in the soil that contains most of the carbon that goes into the soil. So you're not getting soil carbon buildup. All sorts of terrible things happen as a result of rototilling. And when you think about it, why are we taking a plow or a rototill and rototilling the entire garden to put in a row of corn? Doesn't make any sense. Just disturb the area where you're putting the seed in. We've all seen seedlings grow through sidewalks, grow through cement, grow through tar, asphalt. Phew, it's crazy. We rototill for the wrong reason. Once you break that soil up and turn it into a bacterially dominated soil, you're done. You don't need to rototill again. Simple as that. And if you do need to rototill again, then you need to put the soil food web back in and make it all better. Anyway, uh, when you end up rototilling, doing all these things, using these chemicals, you end up with anaerobic pockets in the soil. Now, anaerobism is what's used to produce alcohols. And it turns out one part per million touching a plant root kills it. Hmm. So you don't want these little pockets of anaerobic areas in your soil. Not good. So don't rototill. You know, alcohol does not do good things to the brain. It doesn't do good things to the plants. And as a result, you've rototilled You've put down chemicals, you end up with the opportunistic bad guys because there isn't diversity anymore. There isn't a lot of things that were there to protect the, uh, you know, everybody. You end up with the bad guys coming forward. And the next thing you know, you wake up one morning, you go out to the garden, and you have a bad case of toilet paper flipperophorus. What the hell do you do? Incidentally, I have eight acres in Anchorage, Alaska. My daughter was 14 years old. <laughs> The guys in the high school class discovered that McDonald's has rolls of toilet paper that are this big. And eight acres of property was covered with toilet paper. I'm convinced when the grandkids come, they will continue to be picking up toilet paper. <laughs> but anyway, so what do you do when you get a bad case of toilet paper flipperophorus? Well, you know, you go to True Value or Lowe's or Ace Hardware, and you ask the genius there, what do I do? What should I use? And of course, he doesn't know. So he goes and asks the supervisor, all you needed to do was just walk in and follow your nose because you can smell the stuff. Ever go into a 
true value hardware or nace hardware and not smell fertilizer <laughs> it's terrible uh, and of course you buy the stuff you go home after having read the label very carefully no first of all if you're my age you can't read the label because it's too small, you have to have a razor blade to cut it, open it up, and read the thing. It's unbelievable. And of course, so you suit up, and you do, you, no, nobody does this kind of stuff. And you end up spraying, you spray the bad guys as well as the good guys. These poisons are never you know, working for one guy. It's a slippery slope. Things get worse, and they get worse and worse. What do you do? What do you do? You know, you gotta figure out what the hell to do. Now, you can take this route, <laughs> You know, or or you can pay attention and do the right thing. You know, uh, you know who wants blemished food? Nobody wants blemished food. You know, lawns with weeds in them. Well, it turns out you want a lawn with weed in them because if it doesn't have weeds in them, it's because they chemically treated it probably, and you don't want to walk on it. Um, incidentally, sometimes Google dogs, lawns, Ro uh, Long Island. Read about the cancer. That Dogs are getting there. Uh, and then, of course, we got kids that play on our lawns, which we've sprayed with all sorts of stuff. You know, and, we, and we do this with full knowledge, complete full knowledge, that this stuff isn't safe. We all know it. Even Donald Trump knows it. The stuff's not safe. And yet, we let them make it. We let them sell it, and we let them put it on our food. And we wonder why one out of nine women has breast cancer. Now, I am thoroughly convinced that I gave my wife breast cancer. I caused her breast cancer. There have been 14 different chemicals that until I wrote the first book and became incredibly organic that I recommended in my garden columns. One of which I'll never forget was called Saigon 2E, C-Y-G-O-N 2E. I learned about it from the American Rose Society. You could take it, you could paint it around a rose bush, just around the branch, and it was systemic, and it kept the aphids from, from getting into the bush. You could do it around a birch tree. A little six-inch thing around the birch tree, and boy, you didn't get any birch aphids, which means you didn't get any of the sap on your car, and your lawns didn't turn black, and you didn't get the fungus that eats the... Wow. So I wrote about it. And I remember the first time I used it, I had a styrofoam cup, and I put the stuff in the styrofoam cup. I went to get the, the brush, and by the time I got the brush to the cup, the cup was gone. Holy cremolo. So, you know, I started writing, you need to use a coffee can, blah, blah, blah. Uh, <clears throat> well, these 14 chemicals were all taken off the market voluntarily by the companies themselves because they were that bad. Holy crow. We wonder where breast cancer comes from. I don't think there's any question myself, but that's just my own personal thought. Uh, you know, you get to the point where even the moose are on their knees praying that you stop using these things. Start using the soil food web. I don't want to offend anybody. You've heard me long enough now to know that I will say anything to get a laugh. <laughs> these are Muslims. <laughs> I apologize. Anyway, um, <clears throat> you know, some things are just so obvious that they just really shouldn't need to be stated. Of course you only ski in the winter when there's snow, you dopes. Yeah, okay, uh, you know, so what you do is you put the microbes back and you reestablish the soil food web and there's easy ways to do it. Compost, compost teas made out of good compost, mulches, and mycorrhizal fungi. And those four things will enable you to restore the soil food web to your soil so that you don't have to worry about it. So let's talk about compost. Compost is incredibly important stuff. In Seattle, you have to compost. If you don't compost, you can't live there. Simple as that. Um, and and uh, the reason why compost is so good is because it contains all of the fertilizer bags, the bacteria and the fungi, and all of the fertilizer spreaders, save one, uh, the protozoa and the nematodes, that you'd ever need. The only thing that's not in compost is mycorrhizal fungi. And why? Because it needs the signal from the root in order to form the mycorrhizal. And so, and so you don't have any plants in the fungus, so you're not getting any signals there. So you have to add mycorrhizal fungus to compost when you use it. 
great stuff. And you don't need to bury it. You don't need to rototell it in. A little one, inth, one, one eighth to one half inch layer on the soil will work its way down. The soil food web organisms, worms and everything else will work the stuff down into the root system in lickety split time. So you don't have to destroy the soil to do it. Now there are some problems with compost. The first is you've got to have a spouse that's willing to turn your pile for you. <laughs> this is my wife. She's not here with me so I can talk about her. I, I put this picture in the book because I thought it was a good picture. <laughs> she did not. <laughs> I spent quite a bit of time on the couch when the book came out. <clears throat> uh, if you have a big, compost, a big uh, garden, a big farm, you need a tremendous amount of compost. And, you, and so, you know, you got to get it. And you got to know where your compost comes from. Because if it's got the wrong stuff in it, it can do some bad, bad things. So that if it has chlorophyllid, you know, it's going to kill your plants. If, if it has tetracycline in it as a result of the, you know, the vet feeding the horse, blah, 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 and it wasn't composted properly, the tetracycline gets on the leaf as the plant grows through it. And you end up with people who are allergic to tetracycline getting sick when they eat your plants. So you got to know where your compost is coming from. Um, and you can make compost that is bacterially dominated and fungally dominated. And there are more and more systems being developed to make fungally dominated bacteria, uh, uh, compost. Uh, these are the formulas that you need. Again, they're in the book. If you want to write them down, you can. Uh, and basically, you just add more brown, woody material to make the fungal compost. And then you can make compost teas out of these composts. And if it's fungal, then you get a fungally dominated tea, et cetera, et cetera. So these are starting formulas. You can make your own designer compost well worth doing, and you can send the stuff into Dr. Elaine Ingham's soil food webs, and you can have the stuff tested, and you can determine what your compost is. Worm and vermicompost, I already mentioned why it's so valuable, because what goes in the worm and comes out the other end is highly, highly concentrated. Terrific, terrific stuff. OK, and so again, you just need to put a little bit down. And when you use compost, you'll have the best farmer garden you ever had. It's all I ever use. Never use anything else. Unbelievable. It's incredible. Because it feeds the plants. It's got all the nutrients it needs. It's got the soil food web in it. And it supports the soil food web in it. So it's just absolutely terrific. Um, and of course, the problem with compost that a lot of people see is that it doesn't stick to leaves. So you want to get some of these microbes on the leaves for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is they will outcompete the bad guys for space. They'll outcompete the bad guys for nutrients. Uh, <clears throat> and sometimes they actually feed the plant. And so people have developed this concept of compost teas. And you can get compost tea brewers and make your own compost tea. You can buy compost tea. Um, very highly popularized by Dr. Elaine Ingham. But because it's compost, it's very hard sometimes to duplicate studies on this stuff. It's when you use it that you realize how effective this stuff is. It's really absolutely incredible. Um, you can buy compost tea brewers right here in town, as we well know. Uh, and you can buy all the ingredients you need to make compost tea here as well. In Anchorage, Alaska, you can buy the compost tea itself. There are about 11 places that sell it, and they make quite a bit of good money. I actually put one of my son's friends in high school into the compost tea business, and he made so much money that he paid for his college the first summer. And the second summer, he hired his father and his two cousins. And his mother did the bookkeeping. What a business. Uh, so it's something to be thinking about. Compost tea can be complicated to make because it takes 24 to 48 hours. So that means if you're going to put it down on the weekend, you know, you got to make it ahead of time, blah, blah, blah. It might rain. Um, it, 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 it loses its, its, its value after a while because the, the, the organisms either eat the stuff that's, and then they begin to die off or they uh, go anaerobic. So uh, what a lot of people have started doing is making compost extracts. And in fact, Vital uh, sells a special bag that you can use to make compost extract. You just take compost, you put it in uh, uh, or cheesecloth, and you just knead it for 15 minutes. Now, when you make compost tea, you're, you're actually stripping out all of those uh, bacteria and fungi, using a bubbler usually, uh, and then you're feeding them to make them grow. So in this one, you're just stripping them out. You're not feeding them. 
but still you get a good, a good mix and you can use this as a, a great compost tea. Um, and Vital sells the tea itself. So does Peaceful Valley, I'm sure. No, I don't mean to pick on just but good people at Vital, my friends. Uh, and here are some uh, 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 pictures of compost tea being applied. There are a lot of places that say it doesn't work. And I say they're wrong. Simple as that. So here, for example, is a commercial company in South Africa with and without compost tea. This guy incidentally came up to a talk uh, in Connecticut that I gave, that one I gave where, where I, I gave the first Horton the Who talk, and he came up to me and he said, I read your book, I live in South Africa, I came up here just to meet you, I started a business in South Africa, I'm now the largest purveyor of organic foods in Africa because of your book. I said, oh, thank you very much. I made 25 cents off of that guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I'm just kidding around. But anyway, so unbelievable. This is Dr. Elaine Ingham's first office. This is, this is you know, fertilized, compost, no compost tea in the back. Unbelievable. This is the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. Everything on the grounds is compost teed. There are some before and after tomatoes, I mean, potatoes. Uh, this, is, this is John Evans, who lived in the Matanuska Valley. I think he's in the Philippines now. Uh, <clears throat> and his wife, Mary. Now, John's small, but he's not that small. <clears throat> and so what he's got there are a bunch of large vegetables. He doesn't rototill. He only uses compost tea. Uh, I took this picture to show you this. That's a 47-pound zucchini. I took that zucchini down to the Seattle Flower Show. And uh, in the Northwest Flower Show, and because it's 47 pounds, I fly Alaska Airlines, they have a 50 pound limit. I had to put it in its own suitcase. So it was in its own suitcase, and I get to the show, and I open it up, and there it is, and there's and it's glory. And, and attached to, the, to, the, to it is a little TSA card, <laughs> and through your luggage, and stapled to that little card is a handwritten note that says, Holy shit! <laughs> I think that's a, I think that's a 27 pound cauliflower, 29 pound leek, uh, small cabbage, 50 pound cabbage. Uh, uh, incidentally, cabbages are not mycorrhizal. If your kid doesn't like the way a vegetable tastes, chances are it doesn't have a mycorrhizal association. So all of the members of the coal family know mycorrhizal. And in fact, you think about it, they grow so fast, they probably don't have enough time to form the association, they don't need it. Um, Interesting kind of stuff. So it doesn't work. You know, the Cooperative Extension Service tells us it's master gardeners, don't use compost tea, it doesn't work. They're not allowed to talk about compost tea. They can't write about compost tea. If they do and get caught, they get in trouble. You know, so I like to show this picture. This is Drew Faust. She just retired as president of Harvard University. This is Harvard's first compost tea machine. This is Lee Fleischer. Lee Fleischer uh, took Alaska humus and made a compost tea and put it down after the World Trade Centers went down to restore the microbiology to the soils. And then he used compost tea on Battery Park, which he was in charge of. And Battery Park has trees in it that are twice the size of the trees right across the street that never got the compost tea. So he goes to Harvard to do a master's degree on compost tea, and he convinces Harvard to try it. I'm here to tell you, when you park, Bezo, are you still here? There you are. When you park your car in Harvard Yard, you're parking your car on a yard that's been compost teed. Simple as that. When they do exams at Harvard, they now take the exam books and they compost them. Wow. All of the food throughout the university system, throughout the world, is composted so they can make compost tea. Now, when I first wrote Teeming with Microbes, Bezo and I went to our, it must have been our 15th reunion. And the book had just come out, and they said, bring, you know, bring anything you got you know, that you wrote, or blah, blah, blah. So I bought a copy. I had one copy of the book. And I brought it, and I put it down on the table. And all of my classmates, Laughing their heads off. Lowenfels, what is this crap? What the hell is this? This is the funniest book I ever, oh God, I got more grief. We go back to the 25th reunion. <laughs> There's signs up talking about compost tea, you know, and I'm going, huh, 
Lowenfels. What a book you wrote there. You know what I mean? Anyway, it wasn't me. It was, it was T. Fleischer. The stuff. You mean uh, Wasu? Yeah, I don't know. Linda Chalker Scott and crew? Yeah, what happened to her? I think she's still there. I think she finally got enough people to. She, she hates Dr. Lee Ingham. Yep. They don't get along. Yep. And so I don't know. I don't know why. But let me just tell you this. I went to Harvard. If it's good enough for Harvard, mother, it's good enough for me and should be good enough for everybody. It's unbelievable how great compost tea works. Uh, you know, it's phenomenal, and you owe it to yourself to try to make some and use it. It's really terrific stuff. Now, mulches. Mulches can be bacterially dominated and can be fungally dominated. Uh, and so if you have a green mulch, it's bacterially dominated. If you have a brown mulch, it's fungally dominated. Green mulches are covered with protozoa and bacteria. In fact, if you take a green mulch and you, uh, uh, hay or straw, and put it into a bucket, you can grow the paramecium that you can use on your soils. So you use brown for fungal, and you use green for bacterial. What falls down from a plant is supposed to be there to decay and then feed the plant. What do we do as farmers and growers? We come and we harvest. So the stuff doesn't feed the plant. There's something known as the law of return. It's the a basis of nature. The law of return. The stuff goes back in. You get a sustainable system. But we take the stuff out so that the system isn't sustainable. Well, in, in, in practical terms, you've got to go back and put that stuff back down again in the form of mulch. There are no bare soils in nature. They've always got a cover on them. So you use for annuals, like snapdragons, a green mulch, straw, hay, grass clippings. Uh, peonies, you'd use a brown mulch. Vegetables, you use a green mulch. Again, uh, really simple, easy to do, and boy, I'll tell you, the results are phenomenal, not the least of which is you don't have to weed anymore because you've covered up the soil so that the weeds don't grow. All right, and then you've got the ecto and the endomycorrhizal fungi. Now, we used to say that these guys were ubiquitous. You didn't need to apply them. They were everywhere. They were just there. You didn't have to worry about them. But in fact, that turns out not to be so. Um, so we start out with the ectomycorrhizal. These are old. Uh, these are the reasons why there are plants on the earth. Uh, if they didn't associate with these fungi, they would have stayed in the water. Uh, but we ended up with this wonderful association. Most of the trees are ectomycorrhizal. All of the nut trees are ectomycorrhizal in particular. Um, and the ectomycorrhizal fungi always produce a fruiting body you can see, either a truffle underground or a mushroom above ground. So they're, they're ecto, they're big, you can see them, uh, and they infect the plants, uh, and they go out and get all these good things. They form these mushrooms. And so if you see mushrooms around the base of a tree, chances are you're looking at a mycorrhizal fungi that's feeding the tree. X, X, right. This is not a mycorrhizal fungi. That's not a tree. <laughs> right? OK. Uh, this is a mycorrhizal fungi. This is the Amanita mascara. And they happen to grow everywhere in Alaska. I don't know if they grow down here. But in Alaska, they grow everywhere. In Anchorage, Alaska, if you have a yard, you have mycorrhizal, and you have these growing near your birch trees. And I get phone calls from people all the time saying, what do I do about these terrible poisonous mushrooms? And I say, geez, if you didn't have those mushrooms, your birch trees would be dead. They're feeding your tree. Leave them alone. Don't worry about it. Just teach your kids not to be stupid. Um, and so they, hopefully they do so. Now, these are definitely poisonous mushrooms, let me tell you. <laughs> and if you eat one of these guys, you have the psychedelic experience of your life. And it may end up being the last experience of your life. So people don't really normally eat these things. Incidentally, this is where Christmas came from. This mushroom is responsible for Christmas. This is Santa Claus colors. This is Christmas. I will explain to you why. So this is what the 
roots look like around a tree that's infected with Amanita muscara. They're coated with this mycorrhizal fungi. And, uh, you know, every now and then they get eaten by something. I think, hmm, that's strange. There you go, at the courthouse. Oh, I love it. Uh, so here's the deal on these guys, and here's why it's a Christmas plant, a, a, a mushroom. So in northern Siberia, there were these uh, shaman with these tribes, and what they would do is they would follow around the caribou, and they would find a caribou that was eating these mushrooms. And then somehow, I don't know how they do this, I'm going to figure this out before I die, somehow they collect the urine from those caribou. And the shaman eats, he drinks the urine. And he trips out like crazy. And then his urine is collected, and the village drinks his urine, and it's party on time. Uh, <clears throat> I actually found on the internet, this is how close I got. I'm sorry about doing this, folks, but I think you're a mature audience. I found a caribou pee picture, which I thought was pretty incredible. So I'm a little bit closer to how they collected the pee. I thought that was kind of an amazing thing. Uh, and of course, again, the guy goes completely stoned out of his gourd. Uh, here's another pee picture, so I'm getting closer. Uh, and they, they drink the pee, the whole group, and they go crazy. Now, Christmas, Rudolph. <laughs> Seriously, it comes from the Amanita and some psychedelic trip somebody had and invented uh, stuff. Now, you know, there must have been a pee test for Santa Claus or something. I mean, I don't know what the story is, but what I don't understand is how the heck they figured out that it was the caribou urine, not the fox urine, or the dog urine, or the cow urine. Whew. How much urine did they drink in order to figure that out? I don't know, but I thought it was kind of interesting. And mushrooms themselves are fascinating. Oh my gosh, if you've, if you've ever started to you know, look at the different kinds of mushrooms and collect mushrooms, and unbelievable. And these, of course, are the delicious, delicious oh, morels. Uh, and they associate their mycorrhizal, all of these beautiful, beautiful mushrooms. Mushrooms are fascinating because what, what they really are, they're just fungal hyphae. And they come together and they form this little teeny nut in the soil. And they sit there. And then it rains. It's just like one of those little sponge things, you know, like it rains and 24 hours later, you get the mushroom. Really cool. Uh, you know, so it's just fungal hyphae. And then, of course, they produce these spores. So it's like one of those, you know, sponge things. So they produce these spores. Uh, a spore coming out of some mushrooms is like throwing a football three miles. The pressure on some of these mushrooms, unbelievable. And some of these mushrooms are spread by animals. You know, so a squirrel will eat it and, you know, go wander around and poop and, and spread the mushroom. Um, and there are some beautiful ones. I just, just, just quickly go through some of these. Look at these mushrooms. Unbelievable. Many of which you've seen. That one smells like blood. Uh, look at this one. And, okay. All right, anyway, so those are the ecto. Then you have the endomycorrhizal. They're a little bit younger. The endomycorrhizal are different than the ectomycorrhizal in that they don't have uh, visible, you know, you don't really see them. They're, they're, they're very small. Uh, you have to add the spores to compost, you know, we mentioned that. So they're very, very small, and you have to stain them in order to see them. So they form these little structures. So what you get are these vesicles, and these vesicles contain water. And these vesicles are also capable of turning into spores under certain conditions. And then you get the fungal hyphae going in between the stuff there. So uh, they form these tree-like structures. This particular kind is called an arboruscular uh, fungus because of these tree-like structures that go out and get the goodies and bring it back to the plant. Uh, here's one of those structures inside the, the plant. And this is one of those vesicles. These vesicles hold enough water so that if you're growing plants in a drought situation, they'll draw water off of these vesicles. So in addition to going out and getting food, they actually do get water too, you've got water 
located right inside the plant. So even if the mycorrhizal dies, you end up with the plant getting enough water. So again, you have to stain them in order to be able to see them. These are some great pictures of what they look like. Um, mostly vegetables, cannabis. They all use this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, fungi. They are now able to identify them with DNA, which is, which is fortunate um, because we wouldn't know what they were if we didn't. These are the different kinds of mycorrhizal fungi, but again, those other two are the only ones we actually care about. This is what they look like, the different kinds, and how they all invade slightly different uh, ways into the soil, uh, I mean, into the uh, fungus, and they all do slightly different things for their plants. Um, so these are, the, these are the ecto. And you never heard of them. You know, most people never heard of them until 1998, 1990, uh, 2000. And the reason you never heard of them is because they were discovered at the same time that the fungal pesticide in, in, in the fungicide industry was being developed. And we all know in this world, you know, money talks. Research kind of gets pushed. But if you've got money, you can push out there. And so, you know, the fungal side industry, fungicide industry, you don't want to put fungus on your plants. They're bad for your plants. You know, they kill plants, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, then they, just, they, they had trouble growing them because it turns out that if you're giving your plants food, they don't send out the signal to associate with the mycorrhizal fungi. And lots and lots of research facilities, almost all of them, were using Cornell mix, which has phosphorus in it. So there was phosphorus being given to the plant. Why does it need to have a mycorrhizal fungi go get it? So they didn't have mycorrhizal fungi. So very hard to study. It wasn't until the 1950s that they were actually able to grow mycorrhizal fungi in a lab. And even today, there are only 18 out of about 360 that were able to duplicate and grow in a lab. 18 out of all of them. Uh, so if you put too much phosphate down in your soil, you're not going to get the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, if you rototill, you break up that mycorrhizal fungi. So that's not a good thing. Uh, and of course, we lose stuff. And these are the plants that don't like mycorrhizal fungi. Incidentally, people are always asking me, who's Wayne Lewis? The guy whose name is on the uh, team with microbes, that's Wayne Lewis right there. He and I ran a business together, and I wrote the book while he answered the telephone, so I put his name on it. I don't think he's ever read the thing. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> he gets a little check every, every year. Um, some plants don't need the mycorrhizal fungi because they've developed their own systems of getting phosphorus. And phosphorus is the key thing that a mycorrhizal fungi brings back. Nitrogen, zinc, some of the other stuff, but phosphorus in particular. Now, spores. So we used to think they were everywhere. They're not. And the reason why they're not is because they don't travel very far. So the spores that are on the ectomycorrhizal fungi, really small, teeny. You've got to make spore prints in order to be able to see them. And they'll travel about two miles. So if you've got a nursery, you know, two miles down below a, a bunch of conifer trees, you're getting conifer ectomycorrhizal fungi in the nursery. But you're not getting any from 10 miles away or six miles away. They just don't travel that far. So they look like that, microscopic. They form these kinds of prints. Uh, and again, they come out of the mushroom. The mushroom comes up out of the ground so that they'll disperse and be able to blow and disappear. And then you've got the, the uh, endomycorrhizal fungi. You can't see the endomycorrhizal fungi, but the spores, it turns out, on endomycorrhizal fungi are very big. And a lot of them you can see with a naked eye, which is incredible. A lot of them you can't, but you can see them with a, with a hand lens or a microscope. This happens to be one known as rhizophagus interocetes which is used on tremendous numbers of vegetable plants. It's the one for cannabis. And if you use this, you get better and bigger and healthier vegetables with a lot less fertilizer input on your part. Same thing with your cannabis, I might add. Um, there are the spores. You can see the spores. You can actually sieve some of these spores using soil sieves. So these are the ecto. You can't see the ecto, but you can see some of their spores. They can be identified, and you can use them to identify the fungus that you got involved. Some of them look like salmon eggs, um, really look like, like bait. Um, and what they do is they take the roots that contain the mycorrhizal fungi, and they break them up 
and make what are known as propagules. So when you buy mycorrhizal fungi, what you're buying are propagules of roots that have a mycorrhiza in them, okay? And so, uh, you know, they, they look like this. And you can make your own by taking infected plants and breaking up the roots and using them. You know, I, I love this joke. <laughs> Those sick bastards, they break them up. Okay, anyway, uh, propagules, which is another word for cutting. You can grow your own mycorrhizal fungi. This is a system that was developed by Rodell. Uh, if you go onto the internet or look at the book, the system is explained in there. You can grow your own using Baja grass. Um, you can, you know, put a row. Uh, they grow in the rows on the edges of your property. Those are always good to keep. Uh, so you get good mycorrhizal fungi there. You can grow them in greenhouses. There's lots of different ways you can produce your own, or you can buy them. Nothing wrong with that, but you just want to make sure you get viable spores. So you don't want to buy them that are too old. They last about two years so far, we can tell. You don't want them to be, you know, stored in 150 degrees. Uh, you know, it's just so you got to be careful when you buy them. Uh, but they definitely work. And why do they work? You know, well, I showed you why they work, but why would you want to use them? First is you use less fertilizer. Because the fungi is going out there and getting fertilizer for you. Uh, you know, and how does it work? Well, you know, we know, we know this system. Um, what, you, what you end up with uh, in, in, in a growing situation is the root goes into the soil and you end up with a depletion zone around the root, okay? The root hairs have gone out far as they can go. You can't get any more stuff. And so the plant has a choice. It can either use a lot more energy and grow a lot deeper, mine new soil, or a little bit of exudates, track mycorrhizal fungi. They're much smaller than the roots, and they go out and mine the new area. So they, they would prefer to do this. And they go back again and bring back all of these wonderful nutrients. Whoops, yep, whoops. Hmm, maybe I can. Yeah, there we go. Yep. Of course, you could buy the book, you know. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> I know you did, I'm teasing. Uh, so here's some before and after pictures. You know, because people say, that eh, they don't work, you don't need them. Yeah, you do. <laughs> The first thing the, for, excuse me, the Forest Service does when they go back into an area is they use mycorrhizal. Potatoes, who would have thought potatoes have a fungus growing on them? Carrots, lettuce, unbelievable. Corn, not sure what that is. Sorghum, I guess. Uh, strawberries, grapes, daffodils, marigolds. Before and with and without, Australia, landscape plants. You can buy this stuff at local nurseries. If you go to a nursery and it's not selling mycorrhizal fungi, you go talk to the owner and say, why aren't you carrying mycorrhizal fungi? If he or she says, well, we already put it in the plants, then you're okay. You know, if they say, well, because you don't need it, get out, go to another nursery. Yeah. Yeah, some of it can be mycorrhizal, some of it isn't mycorrhizal. A lot of it's just decaying a lot of the organic material, so chances are it won't hurt your compost pile by putting it in there. Yeah, but all the fungi get that, basically. So you can't tell just by looking at the mycelium whether it's mycorrhizal or not. But probably won't hurt stuff. Uh, you know, look at this difference. I mean, it's just the density is phenomenal. The root systems are completely... You get more soybeans. You get more nitrogen fixing as a result of the association. Then you, you get water, you know, for the reason I explained. So in a drought in Illinois four years ago, if you used the mycorrhizal fungi, you got a crop. If you didn't use the mycorrhizal fungi, you didn't get a crop. Which is not a good thing, as you know. So and there's where they contain the water. Uh, it holds the soil together, it's that mycelium. So you, we don't end up with this terrible problem we're facing in the United States, which is we're losing our soil. Tremendous amounts of soil every year. And then because it's got chitin in it, the nematodes don't like it. So it acts as a, as a protector. 
and, and the nematodes don't go in because they don't like the way it tastes. And then it produces this stuff, this glycoprotein, that's the waterproofer, which contains a substance called glomalin or glomalin. And this was discovered in 1996 by the United States Department of, of Agriculture. Uh, it was a, a, a substance that they always found in soil. They couldn't figure out what the heck it was. They stained it. Turns out it stains green. It coats these endomycorrhizal fungi with this glycoprotein coating. Glycoprotein is important because it has not one, but multiple carbon sites. So if you've got glycoprotein, you've got a molecule that has tremendous amounts of carbon. This is produced by these fungi. So they produce carbon. They literally suck the air, carbon out of the air, and they produce carbon in the soil. How much carbon? We used to think that the carbon in our soil came from humic acids. Humic acids are maybe 13% of the carbon that goes in your soil. Mycorrhizal fungi produce 37% of the carbon that goes in your, fungi, in your soil. Now, when you think about it, it's sort of like collecting newspapers for recycling. You start out with one. And then by the time you end up going to the recycling center, you got a whole station wagon full of newspapers. That's what you want with mycorrhizal fungi, because those newspapers are carbon. You're getting carbon produced constantly by these mycorrhizal fungi. That's why no-till is recommended for climate protection. We're not destroying our carbon by tilling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's key, and it's because of that. Now, this glycoprotein also provides a rigidity to the fungus because they're very loose and floppy, and it seals gaps that are in these fungus <laughs> so they don't leak, which is very important. And I apologize for this picture. My wife says, that's a little edgy, Jeff. I say, don't come to the talk, I say to her. OK. Uh, and we've heard a couple of references today. These mycorrhizal fungi talk to each other, even if they're not the same plant. So a tree, when it dies, you know, I was always taught, gee, the tree dies, and all the nutrients in that tree go down into the roots, go down into the fungal system to feed the new baby trees that need that stuff. No. You can feed the marigold. You can feed a cannabis plant that's sitting out. You know, they share. Plants share all of this wonderful mycorrhizal network. What an unbelievable thing, and who knew? It's just like the internet. Get all this communication going on. And it gets to the point where we're pretty sure now that the mycorrhizal fungi can alert a forest that it's under attack. Tree gets attacked, the mycorrhizal fungi knows, and tells all the fungi in the network, uh-oh, you better take up X, Y, or Z in order to protect yourself. Mind-boggling. You know, it is the internet, simple as that. It's better than the internet. It's got all these nodes and all this great stuff. Uh, now, there are some mycorrhizal fungi we cannot duplicate. So for example, around blueberries. Blueberries have their own kind of mycorrhizal fungi. And unless you get soil from around a blueberry, you have a hard time growing them. So that's the trick to getting good blueberries, is find a place where blueberries are doing well. In fact, anytime you see a plant that's doing well, chances are, it's got a very healthy mycorrhizal population. Take some of that soil, because that soil will help you spread the mycorrhizal fungi. What would you do with that soil? Well, you'd put it around the plants, or you'd put it right on the roots of a plant that you're about to transplant. So I always tell people in Anchorage, Alaska, never put a plant in the ground unless you first put mycorrhizal fungi on the root ball unless it's one of these plants that doesn't like mycorrhizal fungi. And people do it. And it makes a gigantic difference, a gigantic difference. And the place where you really notice it more than anything else, <laughs> hate to say it, is in the cannabis industry. When I get people, as I'm consulting, to use a mycorrhizal fungi, the right one, the results are night and day, because the stuff works. But wait, there's more. <clears throat> so you take a prairie and you want to grow trees on that prairie. You can't. 
because it doesn't have the right mycorrhizal fungi. But if you bring in the right mycorrhizal fungi, you can establish trees. Now, why would you want to grow trees in a prairie? Well, you probably wouldn't. But if you go to Puerto Rico and you wander around, you say, see, there are no pine trees here. I want pine trees here. So it's 1950. So you, you buy some pine trees, and you plant them, and they don't do well. They grow for about a year. They turn yellow and die. Year after year after year, person after person tried to introduce pine trees to Puerto Rico. Again, I don't know why, but they wanted pine trees there. And then about 1957, somebody said, you know, I got these pine trees. They're doing pretty well in South Carolina and North Carolina. I'll bring them down, see if I can't plant them. Brought them down with the soil. <laughs> Next thing you know, those pine trees lived. And they figured it out. You got to have this soil that has the mycorrhizal fungi, which doesn't exist in Puerto Rico. Hmm, I say to myself, I live in Anchorage, Alaska. I would love oak trees and maple trees. Not my thought now, but it was my thought years ago. There were 14 maple trees in all of Anchorage, Alaska. Now, Anchorage, Alaska is about the same latitude as Norway, Norway maple. How come we can't grow the Norway maples here in, we had no red leaves, none of the trees and the canopy. And turns out, those 14 maple trees came up from Sears Roebuck in Seattle in containers with the soil. Everything else that grows in Alaska comes up bare rooted because it's expensive. It takes me three and a half hours to fly from Seattle to Anchorage. You don't want to ship a tree with so soil from Seattle to Anchorage. You've got to, you know, it's expensive. These 14, they, they, they did the wrong way and they all grew. And so I said to myself, gee, that's interesting. Lo and behold, I go and I took some of the soil. I took one of the seeds and I put it in the ground and it grew. And I said to my neighbor, let's try this on your place. So she did it on her year. We both have maple trees now. Wow. Now it turns out I've had a change of thought about whether we want to introduce non-natives to Alaska. So I think it's a bad idea. But now I know how to control them. <laughs> Keep them away from the mycorrhizal fungi. So sure enough, there was a Russian guy 50 years ago who went to the steeps of Russia and said, we need trees here. Put the mycorrhizal fungi, grew trees in the middle of the prairie, which is unheard of. So there you go. Um, Waikiki, it's a story about Dr. Elaine Ingham. Waikiki Beach, all those palm trees were dying. And they couldn't figure out what to do. So they call Elaine Ingham. She goes down there and she goes, simple. <laughs> you have destroyed the fungus around these trees by compacting the soil. Fungus are very fragile. They're the first thing to go when soil becomes compacted. And so she said, just keep people away. Aerate, keep them away. Pew. Next thing you know, the trees came back. Same thing with the redwoods. Same advice by Dr. Elaine Ingham. Keep people from getting close to them so that they don't destroy the mycorrhizal network. And sure enough, that's how they keep these things alive as a result of uh, Dr. Lane's advice. Uh, <clears throat> this is the Puerto Rico picture. I already told you the story. Um, and again, the first thing that comes up after a fire are the mycorrhizal infected seeds. The mycorrhizal can go through you know, a lot of fire. It certainly can go through frost. And, and if you don't have it, then the trees die. I was, <clears throat> I was an assistant attorney general in, in Alaska. And I represented uh, an agency, and the guy in the agency was, was my main client. And he told me the story that when he first got to Alaska, he planted one summer 50,000 seedling, tree seedlings. 50,000. They all died. <laughs> Every single one of them. He said it was the biggest embarrassment of his life. We didn't know about mycorrhizal fungi. Now we do, so that wouldn't happen again. Uh, OK, and you can use this, this mycorrhizae concept anywhere there's plants growing, anywhere. Doesn't matter what you do, mycorrhizal fungi helps. Golf courses, recreation, schoolyards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's all great stuff. Whoops, yep. Uh, yep, you can. Because I know you bought the book. Uh, and orchids, as I said before, don't, don't even germinate unless you have the right mycorrhizal fungi to be in them. Uh, the mycorrhizal fungi comes in, in, there are only 18 of them, 
They come in different formulas depending on what you're feeding. You know, some of them are in sand, some of them are in sawdust, blah, 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 depending on what. So when you look at the label, you know, say this is for vegetables, this one's for annuals, but it's the same mycorrhizal fungi, it's just a different delivery system. And now there's a company uh, called Bigfoot that's figured out that if you, uh, and they figured it out as a result of the guy who made 90% of the mycorrhizal fungi in the world in Grants Pass, he sold his business to a big company, and they didn't make him sign a non-compete, so he went into business with his son. And they figured out that if you change the delivery factor so that you're feeding the mycorrhizal fungi foods, they do better. And so they, they, they mix it with kelp and different things that feed the mycorrhizal fungi. Bigfoot, look for it. But they have powder forms. You can now get a liquid form of mycorrhizal fungi so that you've got existing trees, uh, existing uh, uh, you know, turf. You can put down a liquid mycorrhizal fungi to, to help it along. And of course, there's now a terrific book on mycorrhizal fungi. This one has now been translated into its second language. Uh, so it's well on its way and it was a lot of fun to write. Um, you need to add mycorrhizal fungi to the compost. Almost done here, folks. Uh, <clears throat> so here's the deal. If you're a soil food webby, and by all means you should be, and if you're organic, you, you are, whether you know it or not, uh, you know, we do things differently. The first thing is we don't use pesticides, because you don't need them. You just don't need them. Don't ask me you know, to prove it. I'm just telling you. I don't use them in my property because I don't need them because I don't have problems. You don't have problems because you use compost tea and compost and the right fungi. The soil food web, when it's in balance, will take out the bad guys. And not all of them. Because some of those bad guys you need to continue to feed the good guys. So it's an interesting thought when you think about it. When you spray and kill all the bad guys and you've got a couple of beneficials that are still alive, there's nothing for them to eat. Kind of interesting. Uh, so we don't use pesticides. Uh, you know, we use different kinds of products depending on, on what, what we need. We try to use as many biologicals as possible. Um, you know, we've got these wonderful heat-seeking guys. We feed the microbes, not the plant. That's what you need to do. The microbes feed the plant for you. It's microbe food, it's not fertilizer, uh, you know. So I just put these here so they're bioinoculants. Uh, you get all sorts of stuff. Low numbers. Below 10, 10, 10. 6, 2, 4, even better. Low numbers, okay? Because if you put on high numbers, again, the plant sits there and goes, I don't need to do this. You're giving me all the food, and you don't want that to happen. You know, you want to plant in soil. You don't want to be hydroponic. Uh, there's a couple of soil food web rules. It's microbe food, not fertilizer. Usually comes in two forms, fish or poop, right? Sometimes worm. But fish and poop, that's poop, I guess. Uh, and there's even a fish and a poop fertilizer. Um, and I always tell people, why buy the fertilizer? Why don't you buy the stuff that makes the poop, <laughs> you know? So you buy all the feed that goes into making the poop, it's terrific fertilizers. So, you know, animal feed is great, great stuff to use in your, in your yard. So uh, if you want stuff biological, blah, 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 all these different things, I don't know why I have this here. Um, I must have given a talk at MicroLife in Texas. These are a Texas company. Uh, you want to manage that glomalin. You want as much glomalin being produced as possible so you don't rototill and you use low or no phosphorus. By the way, we're running out of phosphorus in this country. When you buy lawn food now in the United States of America, it only has two numbers on it. It's not allowed to have the middle number. No phosphorus is allowed in lawn food anymore. We're running out. We're about 30 years away, maybe, peak phosphorus. where we don't have it anymore. Now, this is one of the macro elements that we need for plants. We talk about climate change. We haven't started talking about phosphorus yet. We need to. When does the new administration, that'll happen. When you use um, uh, fungicides, you want to make sure that if you do use a fungicide, it doesn't kill the most important fungus in your soil, the mycorrhizal. So if you go on the internet, you can find these. Uh, you can ask the fungicide company itself 
You can ask the mycorrhizal company itself, but you want to be very, very careful, or you just don't use them. So there are all these things around on the net. Um, you can, what you want to do is, is cycle the, uh, the soil food web life. And one of the great things to do is to make a bacterial protozoa soup. So you take straw, you throw it into a bucket of water, you stir it three or four times a day, and after about 48 hours, you have a protozoa soup. And those protozoa, will you can see them in the water. They're unbelievable. And in about 10 days after you put them on the soil, they're cycling bacteria like no one's business producing nitrogen for your plants. No, it's aerobic. It's aerobic. How long you go back to that? Yep. So about 24, 48 hours. The stuff is coated. Even just using the stuff as a mulch, hay, tall grass, you know, you don't want, you don't want to use straw. You know, you don't want the seeds. Did I say that right, or do you want to use straw, not hay? You want to use straw, not yeah, you want to use straw, not hay. That's, well, it doesn't have to be that dry. It should be, yeah. <laughs> Why would you not want to put organic down, you know? Uh, is it hard to find? I didn't realize that. Make your own. Take grass clippings, you know. You don't need very much of it. So, yeah. Should work. Either way. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you should let the compost microbes take care of it. The worms will take care of it if they'll eat it. If they won't eat it, you know, put it in the compost pile. But they'll take care of it. Okay. Yeah. No. Uh, so the, you can do things like that. Oops, let's see, wrong way. You can't, but let me finish. I got about four more slides, and then we'll, we'll answer lots of them. So you want to recycle all these things that are going on. You know, this is not a bag of dope. This is a bag of straw. You know, your Peaceful Valley supply, you should be selling organic straw. Uh, you know, so you use molasses for bacteria, unsulfured, because if it has sulfur, it'll kill off the microbes. Water, if you're going to be using water for compost tea, of course, you want to let it sit for a while so that you get the air, you get the chlorine out of it. The chloramine is complexed out by the organics that you put in it. Bat guano, great for bacteria. Alfalfa meal, terrific for bacteria. These are great for fungus. Humic acids, soybean meal, fish, hydrolysate. So all of these things will feed fungal. Oh, I've got to leave that up. Okay. Whoops. Sorry, <laughs> left that one out. Let's go back. So it's pretty simple once you know the system. Uh, and so you got these photosynthetic tea kits, there's the, and then you test. Now, the soil food web test is great. It'll test your fungal bacteria ratio. Important, you need to know it. You know whether your soil's got more fungal or more bacterial in it. NPK test, you know, you need an NPK test. You need to know what's in your soil, what's missing in your soil, what's missing from your plant. So you do a test of your plant and a test of your soil, and then you figure out what's going on. And now, take a note on this one. There is a new test, a microbial biomass test. And you can learn about it at www. OK. Yeah. www microbiometer.com, okay? Go to that site, take a look at it. It's a brand, this is about six months old. This woman worked in the medical field. She had a little filter that did blood testing and she sold it for a couple of billion bucks <laughs> and they didn't make her sign a non-compete again. So she heard the lectures on the soil food web and she said, I can make, I can make a test for that. And she came up with the test that now test microbio microbiological biomass. If your mass is high above 250, 300, 400, you don't have to fertilize. If it's low, you have to fertilize. If you take a test of a, let's again, I have to use cannabis, you can tell when it's gonna to start to flower by the change in the microbiomass. Holy crow. 
You can tell whether something you're putting down on your soil to feed your microbes is increasing the microbiomass. This is the test that I now use in order to determine whether something teems with microbes for an endorsement. I could never endorse a product because I couldn't tell. Now I can test the product with this biometer. You can buy a kit for 30 bucks and you can test in your yard in 10 minutes your microbiomass. This is normally a $500, two and a half week test. And it is in the process now of Cornell is studying it, FDA, USDA. This is going to be a standard test. And I'm just here to tell you, this woman has now added pH, fungal bacteria. It hasn't come out quite yet, but it's going to. So you're going to be able to do all sorts of tests. And what you do is you take a little sample of soil, you put it in this little vial with a premix in it, shake it up. Actually, it's got a little vibrator that comes with it. And then you take a drop, you put it on the card, you read it with your cell phone and the cell phone tells you what your microbiomass is, keeps record of it, where it was taken from, so that you can go back and compare it all. Phenomenal! So all of these things are things you want to use, but do look at this microbiometer. Um, and there it is, there's the test. That's what it looks like right there. So cool, that's the card. Uh, so what you want are soils, the best soils you can possibly have. Simple as that. You want your soil to be a condominium. And you don't want a shitty condominium. You don't want a timeshare. You want that $240 million condominium they sold in Manhattan. Okay? You want it to be the best condominium it possible because this is what holds your microbes. This is what grows your plants. You know? So you've got a three-legged stool, light. You want the very best light. That's sunlight, right? Indoors, by the way, it's plasma light. Uh, genetics, you want the best genetics, and you want the best darn soil you can possibly have because it makes it work. So you look for the bigger guys to determine whether your soil is any good, to see what they eat. You look at the art. These are the numbers you're kind of looking for. That's uh, uh, Mary Apple, who wrote a wonderful book called Worms Eat My Garbage. Or Worms Eat My, yeah, Worms Eat My Garbage. Before she, she died, but she wonderful, wonderful lady. Um, you want to keep pests under control, so you want to, you know, out-compete, you want to out-consume, you want to interfere with, okay? You want to think like a soil food webby. These are the questions you ask yourself. Where, how long, how many? Once you get the answers to these things, you can figure out what to do. Not just go buy something that's, you know, general purpose to kill. So if you're not convinced, I always tell people to think about this, okay? You know those, those redwoods? Oh, God, what happened to that picture? Those redwoods? that grow to be 500 years old and older and 370 feet tall and taller? How the heck do they do that without any miracle grow? <laughs> without any roundup to protect around their roots? They do it the way you should be doing it. They team with the microbes even though they never read the books, which you can do. So thank you very much. You're a great audience. And now I want to answer questions. All right, any questions? Bezo, you got any questions? You may need to tackle right now. <laughs> okay, okay, there you go. I haven't seen Bezo in years and years and years and years. Uh, yes? So, when you said we would need to add the mycorrhizal fungi to the compost, is that after the composting process is complete, we're about to apply it? Yes. Not during an action? No, when it's complete. You guys 